Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Safety View. We've got a great conversation in store. I'm gonna hand it right off to my co-host, Rosa. Take it away. Oh, thank you, Tamara. You're welcome. Um, I'm so excited about today's conversation because everyone I know in safety is very concerned about uh, having everyone in the organization feel safe to contribute uh, what they know, what they see, their concerns. Uh, and of course, we talk a lot about psychological safety. Uh, and many of us don't really understand what that is. At least I, I'm still exploring it myself. So I um, met Lauren through, uh, I, I was doing a class on relationship-centered leadership. Actually, it was called uh, the relationship factor in, in human performance. And Lauren uh, turned out to be one of the people that had been thinking about the same thing for a long time. So of course, uh, she's an expert in healthcare. She's an expert in um, human performance. And now uh, is going to help us understand better how to encourage people to participate in the conversation. Lauren, I hand it over to you. Oh my goodness. Well, thank you for that great um, introduction. And yeah, I'm a nurse by background and I, I really have struggled with that. How can it be that we're harming these very people that we intend to help? And what are we going to have to do differently? And lots of things set me on a path to uh, find answers to those questions. And I did spend um, about five years out in the safety world outside of healthcare and really um, was very fortunate to be um, adopted and mentored by many of the HRO experts around the world who, and um, you really just have to self, self teach for that. So I did. And um, as I started looking at um, the nature of things, so, okay, that's my theme, nature. We got the animal shirt, we've got a bird. Um, I use animals to teach HRO. Um, I realized that, wow, we have to, take into account the nature of, you know, not just the complex system, but people. And um, I was so proud of myself because I came up with these questions that would help with high reliability. And then I realized if people don't feel free to answer these questions, we're going to have a problem. And the other problem was that our modern world, there's so much uncertainty. And when you really start looking at ambiguity, you realize you have to, we will never meet the challenge of complexity without diverse voices. So then I'm like, well, oh, how are we going to unlock these things? And I went into a, you know, a deep dive on speaking up in healthcare, and it was so depressing. Um, it was really frightening how healthcare professionals feel that it's um, an un, it is a high risk and low low reward activity. And so to me, that if we have 50 percent, or it, it depends what element you're looking of speaking up for what type of issue there, it differs. Um, and there's actually now they've identified 216 antecedents. Well, I don't think we can go get 216 antecedents <laughs> in place. So we better come up with something else. But, antecedents um, to what, Lauren? Antecedents to, to, to just someone feeling safe to speak. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Well, if this and if that and if this, then then maybe. Um, so I really I, I was like, wow, we are we're going to have to tap these voices. And really, the thing is the Whole, the research is done. Elizabeth Morrison of NYU with the work on silence and of course, Amy Edmondson. And we know um, that we're gonna need leaders voices. So as I, I remember the day on the porch where uh, I just had this bolt of lightning, like this whole idea of telling people to speak up is wrong. <laughs> it's not gonna work. It doesn't align with so many things. And um, I just started to look at, you know, what's the problems in speaking up and I know I mean, maybe this is a great thing to ask the, the audience, you know, what do you think are the problems with, what's wrong with that model? I'd love to see what people have to say. The model of speaking up, Lauren? Yeah, the model of telling, yeah, this, let's call it a strategy. Our strategy as leaders to create upward flow of, of information, okay, in our system is to tell you to speak up. Well, That's I know I know that Gabe and I have had some conversations on this, so I'm going to pull him out first. Okay. Yeah, I was I was literally uh, just unmuting my mic to chime in on this, so that's perfect timing. Um, 
I don't know. I've, I've kind of dealt with this in my own organization as well. And, and granted, I've got a team that's, um, you know, there's under 15 of us here and there are still problems with having that level of communication. Um, and what I've realized is that the, uh, the way that people communicate is, is going to be very unique depending on each person. And that's one of the, the most difficult things to figure out because when you get everyone in a meeting together, and tell them, okay, well, what do you all think? Um, well, maybe I've been kicking around that idea for a while, and this is the first time that everybody on the table is hearing it. And so they're not having a chance to digest it first and then chime in, or maybe they don't feel comfortable speaking in a, a big group. They'd rather you know, throw something in a chat or put a note in, or they'd rather just pop into my office and talk about it. Um, but everyone's communication styles and even the way that the, the timing of their communication can be different. Um, I'm, I'm shocked sometimes at, at the way that ideas will come up, you know, hours or even days after they were first brought up. And if we expect that communication to happen instantly in that one particular point in time, we might not get the, we might not get people wanting to speak up at all. Um, that's what I saw in my organization at times, and it, it got to be very frustrating as a leader. And I'm sure the people that were in my meetings were extremely frustrated too. Yeah, you know, as you were talking, Dave, you, you reminded me of our training. Uh, I'm, I was, I'm trained as a facilitator. And when you're in a big audience room and you say, does anyone have any questions? You'll, you'll get like a silence, <laughs> right? That's like the worst <laughs> question to ask. Yep. But if you put people in dyads that all of a sudden the room is talking up a storm. So you know that that information is there. So your point is well taken that we have to put people in different configurations so that they feel safe speaking up, right, Lauren? Well, yes, and so this is, I was just saying to uh, Tamara when I came up, she said, you know, well, my my thing about uh, the speaking up thing is sometimes someone monopolizes the conversation so there isn't really space. Now, I always came at it from a fear issue, but I think also, Gabe, you're talking a little bit about a space issue. And if you think about, you know, what I'm passionate about is that what we need to know is already there. It's just locked up. And what are the keys to unlock it? So when you think, I think of speaking in as sort of like a liberating structure, a liberating approach, because it's going to be the leader is now taking responsibility, but think about it. So what Gabe is saying is, you know, a meeting is not maybe your most liberating structure for new ideas, especially, you know, even with me going out with, uh, hey world, I think we have a bad strategy. You know, it's a very vulnerable thing. So I think that creating different pathways for different personalities um, is, you know, brilliant. So Gabe, you can be hosted on the next show on your. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll add a little bit too. in that I realized as I was sitting in the meetings, I was just, I came to the realization that I actually really hate meetings. Um, <laughs> I hate being in them. I really didn't enjoy leading them. And I just stopped and thought, why am I subjecting people to this? <laughs> yeah. So I just had to stop. <laughs> Fascinating. Um, that, that is, that is, so some, okay, that, that brings me to a, a big point, um, I think about speaking in, is that my goal, and tell me, I'd love to talk about how people feel, is that the reason we don't have upward communication is because of the, how people experience it. So what I'm trying to say is the, the, the experience of seeking truth as a leader and the experience of speaking truth, it's not experienced in a, in a, in a rewarding way, okay? So how do we transform? It's like, you know what? I'm gonna go find information that's gonna feel good. And I'm gonna say what I'm believing as truth right now, and that's gonna feel good. Because if it doesn't feel good, people aren't gonna do it. So how do we rewire our thinking on both? And especially I would say for the leaders, because it has, um, it has to come from the leaders. So I think that's the a key piece there. But how does everyone, it would be, you know, I mean, in general, is it, what do you think about the feeling piece? How much is that affecting people? Hello, this, um, I, I think that there's a, a real tie in there to just, you know, general psychological pra practice around ego. And like you said, not feeling good. And that emphasis on blame and fear and historical experience and, and the, you know, some of that inequ inequity um, rather than 
solving the solution. You know, let's find a solution instead of pointing blame. And, and so along with that, I think, you know, for sure, you know, fear of retaliation is one of the things that you hear very commonly as being a reason for not speaking out. I agree that Gabe's insight about how people speak out is, is super, super relevant. And, and just also that idea of, you know, your historical experience. And I've had, you know, vice presidents of marketing that say, I am an open book. I, everybody should come talk to me. And I know that they don't like feedback. They don't, they don't, they don't take it well, right? They're like, why does nobody come to my door and, 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 and come in and talk to me? And I'm like, because you don't listen. You say you listen, you think you listen, but, but you don't, you're not open to that. Um, and everybody has that natural in inclination towards defensiveness and ego. And so how do we create that culture where we can really put that aside and focus on, you know, how do we get to a solution? And I'd, I'd like to build on that is also the people who Philip? shut down and, and shut people down. And um, when somebody has an idea, they shut them down instantly and say, no, that's, that's no good. Uh, Phil, did you have something to say? Yeah, I was, I was going to say, you know, I work in a, a very multicultural organization and I, in the nuclear industry, you know, the expectation is that people speak up. And but you can't tell them that's an expectation and expect them to do it. You know, there are, there are a, a plethora of reasons for not doing it. One, one of the reasons that we often don't even consider is, is an individual's national culture, how they were brought up, um, you know, asking, asking questions, raising your, your question, your, your hand and to, to raise a point is just not done in some cultures. I think in other cultures also, there's, there's the, the, the fear of talking about bad things, talking about the negative and talking about the negative publicly. And, and I've, I've experienced that very recently with, with some particular, particular issues. And the, the, the third one for me is when you're working in a multicultural organization, or you have people from just from uh, from a, another culture when they're you're talking to them, and their English is for them English is a second language. We forget that they have to take it in, they have to translate it, and then put it in. Consider the words that they're going to use to see that make sure that their their message is going to be as they intend it to be. We've had some, some real serious issues with Koreans who are very, very proud people. And, and Americans will say, well, well, what's the answer? Come on, what's the answer? So they just don't ask, they will not raise a hand. They will not raise a question at all. So we need to think about the other people where they come from. And it, it's not easy. It's not easy at all. Mm -hmm. So Rob, I saw in the, t in the chat that you had uh, brought up something about people not speaking up for losing face. That was an interesting. Oh, you're muted. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, lose, losing face face is is a, I think a, a serious problem because people have self esteem. Uh, they have they 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 value themselves or not, and they. They are afraid to lose face that they, uh, if they speak up in, an, in, a, in a meeting where, where we just heard about, which is, which is highly sensitive, uh, and some people might knock you down and say, listen, this is not relevant, or this is, not, this is no serious issue. Uh, and if you get responses like that, yeah, it will only uh, discourage you to, to, to speak up because suddenly you might feel a little bit smaller in the group and you say, well, listen, uh, probably my, my opinion here is not, uh, it's not so, uh, uh, so well taken. And uh, next time around, people think twice before they speak up. So it, it's, it's a matter of, do I feel uh, trust in, in such environment to, uh, to speak up? Uh, is my opinion or my, my point of view being valued? Uh, and um, it, it, it requires that, that people have a, uh, they, they, they have a, an understanding with each other uh, that, that also 
uh, it's, it's, it's often said, huh? uh, you cannot say something stupid, but that's not true. Yeah? Uh, if, if something stupid is being said and considered by the group that it is stupid, um, somebody will, will step down and say, well, uh, I, I let my turn pass by this time. And next time, if you realize something that is really something to be brought up, you might think twice. I have a question, Lauren. You mm -hmm. call it speaking in, uh, yeah. and what is the difference in the language? Like, does it have something to do with belonging? It does. Matter of fact, I want to show you a little picture. I want to show you two quick pictures. So I teach, uh, I share my ideas through pictures. So just, this is our normal uh, strategy here, right? The leaders telling people to speak up and and they're think one's thinking um, I'm powerless, the other one thinking this is not safe, and the other one says it won't work. And futility is actually a, a big piece of that. The a key thing about the speaking in when I I came really from a to to survive. If you want to be highly reliable in complexity, you're going to have to deal with the, the uncertainty. So I said, well, wait a minute, we need this, which is a situation focus instead of up to a person. I'm not raising my voice to someone of, of higher power, but I'm contributing my unique perspective that no one else shares to a situation where we have knowns and unknowns. And a big piece of the, the I believe, a, a culture and leaders specifically embracing this is helping leaders to understand the nature of the complexity that they're working in and that you have an imperfect system with imperfect information and imperfect people, and you are going to have to access those perspectives, you know, freely. So the key thing, which Rob was saying is exactly, so the key is to value the diverse perspectives. And I think that's what we're, you know, you come out, well, the leader just doesn't value them. So you have to work in the leader's head, wait a minute, and doesn't, you know, you look back at all the big accidents and we're like, well, we should have listened to those guys, right? Or little accidents. So value is first, then the inc inclusion and invitation to overcome that fear. But this is where exactly it all happens. So this is reframing, speaking up from instead of we've written a lot of rules and we think our processes are perfect to, you know what? Nothing is perfect here today. So I need to know what you think. This is the person of lesser power sharing what they think and it, and it needs to be seen as a contribution. And if this appreciation from the leader doesn't happen, it will stop. Like there, that, that's a key to it. You have to, even if it's, even if you perceive it as dumb, the fact that that person felt they could speak, well, maybe next time you won't be perceiving it as dumb what they're saying. Um, because I'm, I'm just convinced that we work on all of these processes in an, in an organization. We hone them and hone them, but we let the communication process or the or the freedom to speak process lag along at these really horrible numbers. It, you know, um, like this is a this is what drives your ability to learn to li you know the listening. Well, you got, if you want to be a I say a, a learning organization is a listening organization. Well, you need to have something to listen to. So how do we get that going, right? So, um, ha has anyone else seen any other new like or ideas or worked under a leader that did did operate like this? Sue, no. Suzelle has her hand up. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, sorry. I was just applauding. I I loved what you said. To be a learning organization, we have to be a listening organization. What a wonderful tidbit. Thank you. Wonderful. And yeah, I, I've actually uh, worked with someone before that I remember during um, their, when we would have some sort of a brainstorming session, um, the person that was leading the session, he would always go and write something on the board completely off the wall. He, he, you know, we were talking about some financial model and he'd write like, you know, banana peels or elephant. On it, and I just asked him after a certain time, like, why? What's up with the the random word? And he said, because I'm going to be the first one to put the dumbest idea up there. And essentially, any idea is going to be better than what I just put up. And so he did that to give people the freedom to basically throw dumb ideas up there. 
and uh, and it, it was funny because it actually did set the tone for the rest of the meeting, um, just giving that freedom and being able to say, look, I'll be the first one to actually say something kind of crazy and stupid and off the wall, and everything else will look fine compared to this. <laughs> <laughs> Great idea. Philip, you've been trying to raise your hand. Yeah, so um, our, our branch director was someone who, for whom we would, we would have meetings and there'd be a meeting with maybe 25, 30 people. And at the end of the, she would always ask, are there any questions? Always <laughs> silence. Mainly because of her behavior. You know, I, she once said to me, she came to me for some advice and she said, you know, I, I respect your opinion. And then two weeks later, she said, what on earth are you doing that for? And I, I thought, oh, oh, that's a, you know, a com complete step back from where I was. I, so I felt really different about it. She was, she was temporarily moved and we had a, a new, new uh, a, a, another temporary director come in. And the first thing he did, he said on Wednesday mornings for th half, three quarters of an hour, we'll have a rumor mill. And in the rumor mill, you can say whatever you like. You can you can say whatever you like about my about me personally, about everything, anything at all. And people spoke, and it makes such a difference. So the the real influence is the leader, and the response you get from the leader. It That's is me. absolutely. I agree. Rob, how, you have an idea, or you have a technique that has worked. Um. What I found interesting in the time, during the times that I was I was I was I was managing, is is sometimes to share a story, where you you also uh, uh, make it clear that that you're not so perfect as as uh, as maybe people look at you, uh, that you've made stupid mistakes and you tell people that you you made mistakes, and you you are prepared to share them in a sense that there is some form of call it human or call it uh, uh, my learning way that opens up for other people also to share and say okay if somebody like that and he's my manager is prepared to to show up or to speak up then I think I can do as well so it, it, it takes away barriers by showing that you are uh, a human after all even if you are a leader or a manager <laughs> Exactly. You know what I mean? So the leadership aspect, as I just heard before from Philip, I think that that's, and I mentioned that before, it's, it's extremely crucial how the leader sets the, the tone, sets the environment mm -hmm. for other people to, yeah, to, to show, to, to speak up. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is uh, going to, if you bring people into your office, they're going to feel uncomfortable. But if you go out to where they're working, uh, and do one-on-ones or small group conversations, you have a totally different dynamic. I, uh, I worked with a regional manager in electrical utility who um, he did not have a relationship with people. So uh, I had advised him and he did it because not everybody does what you advise them to do, right? That's the first step. <laughs> he went out to the night shifts and talked with that small group and found out how, what they needed and he began to help them. Uh, and so you're build, you have to build that credibility and that trust factor. Get outside of your comfort zone and believe. I, maybe that's what it is, Lauren. I have to believe that people will give me useful information and that will be helpful. Yeah. I always say based on how, you know, we can sort of make a backward path to what leaders really think about it by the experience that the workers are having when they do it. So really the change is it is in the leader's head and then it, in his actions, but, but the hers, it's a hers, what I'm one thing everyone wants is to be successful. So I think the key thing about speaking in is to show leaders this asking questions and getting help from the people in your dynamically changing and fragmented organization is smart. This is not a these are smart questions. And then the key thing, if you look at this phrase, it, it, uh, hey team, um, then there's a blank. Like it could be, what are your questions, concerns, or ideas? It would really help me to know. 
framing, people want to help, okay? So it's all turning it from, we have a perfect process and we're gonna have to speak up if something is about to go wrong or is going wrong, right? So this is a negative, um, we thought we had it all right and just work, work the plan to, it's gonna be really helpful. This is an imperfect system and it's gonna really help me be a successful leader if you were sharing. Now people are like, oh, this is actually helpful for me to speak. Speaking up is not perceived as, you know, we, we say, oh boy, we've re we're throwing someone under the bus or we're pointing out someone else's flaws. And I, I think a key part of it is gonna be in the context of problem solving. Problems are normal, okay? So they're coming every day. So how do we contribute to solving this problem right here, right now? And also not, not really looking at, you know, so much the error um, part of it. Um, a lot of people were saying, you know, the near miss, uh, is it, you know, it's re people are, don't want to expose that vulnerability. Um, and I, I've made some really tiny mistakes late, lately and wanted to go into the fetal position. <laughs> I didn't harm anyone, you know, it's stupid stuff. And I'm like, I feel an existential threat over this. So I think we have to be sensitive to, you know, how we frame, uh, concerns. It's, it's just normal work. It's normal work that we have to be speaking. So and we had, we've had a lot of great conversations in the chat. And I just want to invite people, if there's anybody who wants to come on mic, please do so. You know, do. there's some really great things going on in the chat that would be great yeah, in this yeah. discussion. And Janice raised her hand. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. You know, I just wanted to share something that's very interesting is you know, I, I was hearing all these different tools that were fantastic because some leaders just don't know about these kind of tools or have access to them. And, and uh, so that's one type of barrier. And when I think about another barrier is I think, well, who are these leaders accountable to? Who are they speaking up to and who do they need to speak in with as well? And how can that influence the condition? So we're looking further afield. Um, I'm coming from the mining industry on the very front end, which is the uh, explorers, and they, they're all supported by investor money. There's no revenue, right? So for example, in there, and across the entire industry, there's a big push for, yes, okay, safety, safety's first and, and is always up there. And, and now it's the, um, and diversity and inclusion as well. And, and then we have now ESG goals, sustainable development goals, right, for responsible mining and a really a lot of efforts and a lot of, you know, these groups coming together and metrics and I've always gone in on them and I was like, we're missing something here about what if we had, you know, if we're trying to show, you know, that we are being, you know, a responsible organization, you know, to be, have that outward connection to what customers and investors want, what's missing and it seemed to me there's something around all of these metrics and things and standards and checklists we don't have anything around leadership or what is a learning organization like if you were and i think that's the future in terms of helping um leaders in a very uncertain areas if is there an opportunity to to um it's almost like a business case in a way where um you know, what would, what would it look like to have, you know, indicators of what a learning organization looks like? And I'm just curious about, and, and you know, how that might, you know, ripple effects related to that could be something like um, speaking in and, and, and such things. So just curious about thoughts around that. Yes. Indicators that were a learning organization. Any thoughts off the top of anyone's head? Yes, Philip. I've recently uh, been delivering a first line leader program and, and it's, it's based on the, the program itself is about getting people to speak up and the benefit that the organization would have as a, um, in becoming uh, a learning organization, you know, maximizing the benefit that's available. And, and I start with, with two questions really. And it's, as a leader, do you, do you want to know how work is really done before a bad event or after? 
And do you, as a leader, want to know what people are not telling you? And their, their reaction changes very, very quickly. And they start to, to understand that, okay, this, this, this is something that's serious and I, I need to, to think about it. And then we start off with talking about psychological safety and, and creating the environments where people will feel quite, quite happy to talk about the, the procedure that didn't work or the, the variances that, that go on in a particular job and have done for many years. So it's, um, there has to be, they have to see something that they, that, to make them want to change. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I felt, it hit me one day, so what's, what's leadership, is if you ask someone, hey, this is, this is where we're headed, we need, so we ask you to speak up, you won't speak up. They're not following their leader when they're saying, but what the leader has inadvertently done is through uh, decision-making, responses, whatever's flowing out from leader has created enough fear that they've rendered themselves powerless to learn. And when you realize I, you did this to yourself, I can't imagine any leader would want to do that. I would think you would say, wow, I want to I, I be successful. I've got to change me, which is, I mean, that's, that's the big pieces of this is a leader. This is a leadership. Uh, I think that's the whole, uh, in terms of the foundations of this model, it's leadership based. It's leaders thinking, leaders actions, leaders responses, and what that changes in an organization. And then really leveraging the language. I mean, the up to, the up is definitely directed to a person whereas in, well, maybe this can take some of the social friction away. We're not talking about you or what you think. We're talking about this very real problem in front of us, so. Great point. I'm going to put someone on the spot here because I've known him for about 40 years. Harvey Liss is here and he was making a comment in the chat that we're all talking at the top of the iceberg. We're not going below the iceberg right now. And so I challenged him, Harvey. Mm. Okay. Ask a question that will take us there. Well, um, I'm not sure I can really frame it as a question. Look, I think a lot of what I'm hearing is real, are really good things. And to, to Lauren's point, um, uh, you know, leaders, we go as consultants and we tell leaders these things, but at the end of the day, uh, it really requires leaders to really believe that they want to listen. And a lot of leaders you encounter will say those things, and actually it's not true at all. And in fact, they're very threatened by have, because in a, in a sense, it's a loss of power. It's a yes. loss of authority. So to Warren's point, I don't know, somehow you have to put a, I don't know, some kind of chip in their heads and be able to flip a switch and, and get some self-realization. Um, I, I, anyway, that, 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 let me just give one example of something I wrote. I was working for a very large uh, uh, electrical company that you would all know the two initials of. And um, we were, uh, the, the manager, uh, this was the corporate manager, was telling the work about the business situation. There were about 70 people in the room. And the business situation really impacted these people. I mean, this was their job security, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then he said, are there any questions? No one said anything. And I, I, said, to, I said to Paul, Paul, put them up into small groups. Let them talk in small groups. That creates a safe space for them to say, and then they report it back. It's not attributed to anyone. And the, and the questions just flowed for hours and hours. So I think it goes back to this idea of really, A, do they want to really hear it? And B, what, what does it mean to create a safe space? Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mute now because I've said too much already. Uh, no, no, you haven't. But is there something? Go ahead, Lauren. Let you no, know. no, I think that, that that's absolutely right. And one, so two things. One, I started this really from the sense making. So high reliability is very much about like, are, are you accurately understanding your world in the moment? And in healthcare, we're, we are just dealing with unclear all day, layers of unclear situations. And when you look at the failures in healthcare, most of them are actually sense-making. They misunderstood the situation. 
diagnosis is a sense-making process, okay? And we're failing terribly there with diagnosis. And what I, one of the things I, I believe is that part of it is just our modern world and the fragmentation and the amount of information. So doctors aren't dumber, but they're actually, the way the system is designed has degraded their sense-making process, especially the EHR. So um, I think part of changing a leader's mind is actually teaching them the way the world works. You know, um, you're working in unclear, fragmented situations. Now, do you want to, and, and other key pieces say, this does not take away your decision-making ability. You still get to make the decision. This is your sense-making and it precedes your decision-making. I think that's a key thing and that's going to be very key for physicians. Well said. Uh, Lauren, what do you think about uh, our own ability as consultants or facilitators or advisors, trusted advisors, to listen uh, and to seek diverse opinions? How, how have you found that impacts our ability? At, because Harvey's point was that very few leaders want to listen. And so perhaps very few of us want to listen. I don't know. This is just something I'd like to explore with the group, whether your own personal development has, something, it has an effect on this and your ability to listen and the questions that you ask, Gabe. Yeah, I would 100% agree with that um, with that comment, and um, and Harvey, thanks for bringing that up too, because I think the the leader really has to take that introspective look, um, and that that's that's foundational to a person's ability to lead and to listen and to encourage other people to do the same. Um, that's something that even in this last you know 12, 18, 24 months, I feel like I've really started seeing that a lot more even for me personally um and even looking back at some of the interactions that i've had with my staff and just realizing wow that's why this didn't land right that's why this didn't work is because of my you know inability or um or my lack of desire to to listen um, and then even digging further and seeing, well, why didn't I want to hear that? Or why did I snap back when someone brought that up? Or why did I react in such a way? Um, and realizing that as I started to look at how, um, how I perceive things as, as an individual, not even as a leader, but just as an individual, um, and then as you, you brought up, Lauren, you know, how the world works and how, you know, how do my people understand things and and um how does that work i had to do that that work first before i could even go back and start thinking how do i become a better leader how do i encourage people to to share ideas and to discuss um so i think that for for leaders out there the the best step really is to have that that introspective look that's foundational before we can even start to encourage other people to, to grow and develop. We have to be in that mindset and have that process going in the first place. I agree. If anyone hasn't uh, looked at Tim Clark's work on the four stages of psychological safety, I think I would suggest you do so. He, he's a brilliant man, a great next step in framing those different levels, but he was also saying that on like the word we had it with psychological safety that it's going to be um, the ability to create it is going to be a qualification for leadership and promotion. I mean, um, so that's a good thing. Um, and I like to support leaders. It is a, it's leadership development and I don't blame um, folks for not understanding how, you know, I feel like we didn't equip people. I, I, I say um, it's inside of healthcare, it's like a jungle. So we, we thought it was a factory, but it's not a factory. It's a jungle. Lots is, you know, it's beautiful and it's adaptive and lots is unseen, but um, we didn't, we just didn't pe prepare people with the strategies that these challenges um, of the challenges we're facing. I'll show you a little, this is uh, what helps me. I call the iceberg of knowledge and our, in my tea, I always said the penguin represents humility and you need to be humble because see what you don't know in your organization is just so much greater than what you do know. And if you can start getting grounded in 
wow, so much is, is unseen or unclear or unstable. I call them the uns. And if you, if you sit back and say, how much is not, how much do I not know today? It, you know, it can be a little depressing, but it's like, well, wait, what will happen if I go unlock that? And how can I unlock that? Um, now you're, now you could kind of be on an adventure. <laughs> so I look at it. Well, you're a learner, so that will be <laughs> Anyone else on their personal journey uh, about this topic? Jim, you unmuted, so that usually means. Hi, Rose. Uh, good to see you, Lauren. I just wanted to say that um, I, I tend to agree from a behavior observation standpoint, leaders don't listen. I disagree that they don't want to. And so I think the, the answer is how you bridge that. Um, and, you know, there are some you're just not going to be able to work with. Um, if you believe that 5% of the population is sociopath and that generally is higher in management ranks, you'll need to identify those folks and don't work with them. But for the rest of them, I think that you just need to help them see how to go about it. Isn't it a weight off? Wouldn't it be a weight off your shoulders? Um, not not uh, having to know everything, <laughs> you know, um, that's a well, way. There are, there are ways you can do that. Um, and, you know, Lisa Landy, who's participated on this uh, quite a few times, um, is, is really good at that. I think, Rosa, you've, you've done some of that work. Um, and it's in helping the, the leaders get in in a non-threatening way into existing efforts where you are accomplishing listening and then having them see the benefit and then actually kind of slowly suck them in. And before they know it, they're participating and they go back refreshed and, you know, um, that was the nature of the work that Lisa and I did out there in Berkeley. And uh, it is something that can happen, but I agree with Harvey. When you walk in, uh, especially if it's something where you don't have a longstanding relationship with the, the leader, um, you're just another appointment. Um, can I just add an example, a couple of examples? I mean, first of all, I agree with Gabe and what Jim is saying. I mean, the people who are introspective to start out with, they're already bought in. <laughs> you know, when you start talking about psychological safety, I mean, they get it. It's the people who maybe are not introspective. I, I, there's two situations I can think of where leaders really didn't listen to, want to listen. And what happened is by creating situations where they, where a, a, this was, a, one of was in a power plant here in Michigan. Um, where, where the group of workers, they had to come up with a task of a, a re, you know, bringing the plant back up to service. And th this was a vice president for energy and he heard them and he, he was very opposed to the process beforehand, that he heard them and he realized that they knew things that management didn't know. And it was only through that experience that he came to believe that. Uh, and the other one uh, and it happened where, um, again, it was a leader, this was more of a service station, but he really was opposed to the process. And then he realized that once he could find a way of acknowledging these folks and, and listening to them, he realized that he was better off. <laughs> once, once he could realize that his, that his work was easier <laughs> if he was able to you know, let these people have a voice. So anyway, that's... Just a couple. That was our experience as well, Harvey, almost to a T. Um, we, we brought leaders in um, with the assigned role of providing the kickoff and the keynote, but then we invited them to stay. And they could observe how all this listening, Lauren, was actually really ferreting out things that were important for everyone in that, that organization, the ones that were participating in the, the actual scenarios, but also the, the leader to know. 
because we were basing it on what was actually happening. We were using events that had occurred at those sites. So we had the second and third stories and, and we built those into the narrative. And um, it, it was eye-opening. So I agree with you completely, Harvey. Yeah, I, I, and, and so it has happened, <clears throat> it can happen. Um, someone I'm gonna be working with, Andy Barker, you know, did it in, in Saudi Arabia, be, believing, going to a really hostile culture to say, I believe this can, can work even though the people can't read or write and even though the Saudis are very powerful and he he made it happen by by starting to value the contribution of of the front line and getting focused on problem solving and then celebrating that we've solved a problem right tell the story of we, it, it's normal and good to solve problems so uh, how we you know i think it, the next time an organization is faced with well how are we going to are we going to spend another X amount of dollars on a speaking up campaign or are we going to try something different? I, that, that's how I think it. I feel like we've been at this a while and everybody's saying it's not working. And, and I'm saying it doesn't have to be speaking in, but let's find something that's research based with good language that is going to include leaders and and start solving our problems. And especially in healthcare, um, you know, it's, we've got a powerful hierarchy there that's working against us. So. We'll see. So more questions in the chat or Tamara, where are we at? We lost her. That's a great comment. So you're muted Tamara. There you yeah, go. Yeah, no, my bar was up because there was chat going, so I couldn't get to my mic. Um, no, we're still good for some time. Uh, we've got okay. 10 more minutes, so don't let me interrupt you. Okay. Um, anybody Any have questions, more questions or... Um, so yeah. Lauren, maybe, maybe I'll just contribute a couple of things. Mm. So on the practical side, uh, talking about Rose's um, experience of going out to a plenary and saying any questions and crickets kind of thing. So I have inherited the chairship of an organization of which I know nothing. They wanted me because of my leadership skills. So I'm like, okay, fine. I'll, I took a look at their mandate and I have attended their sessions for a couple of years, so I have a feel for the industry, but I'm not from that industry. And I told them, like, I don't have credibility in this industry, but um, so, but if you want me as a leader, then I'm gonna shake things up. We're in a virtual world right now. So instead of having the traditional, let's get a speaker, let's, you know, let's the executive get together, think of who do we know that'll be a good speaker? What do people wanna listen to? And, and racking our brains and trying to get somebody matching schedules and all this kind of thing. I said, look, let's figure out what people are concerned about. Let's, I mean, it would be best to actually talk to people to do this, but we were running out of time. Let's brainstorm among us. You guys are in the industry. What are pe what is worrying people? And we came up with some things. So I said, okay, on January 12th, we're going to have a different meeting. And I took a long time to be able to describe how Zoom works and how you know breakout rooms work. And people spend 40 minutes in breakout rooms talking about issues that we guess they were concerned about. It was a poorly intended meeting. There weren't too many people there. One of the groups had, well, two of the groups had two people. It's awfully hard not to talk to somebody if you are in a breakout room for 40 minutes to say nothing. It's not so bad if there's, well, how many are, 30 of you, you can not say anything in 30 people, but if there's two of you, it's very difficult to be able to get away with that. And um, at, uh, when we had an executive meeting afterwards, one of the executives was in one of those groups of two. And he said, in person, the person that he was in that room with he had seen before. We had they had been at meetings for years. He had never talked to her though. Never had you know. So this is where he he realized the power of this virtual existence, forcing people into breakout rooms. You're gonna talk because you have no other choice. And um, and so now he had suggested. So next Tuesday we're going to be changing the format again. We're going back to a speaker kind of thing. But instead of going speaker to Q&A, 
we're going speaker, breakout rooms, then Q&A. Because, you know, putting Q&A on the spot, you're, eh, people are not going to be comfortable. But put them into the breakout rooms, get them to talk to each other. You might be able to garner questions. So that was one thing that I just wanted to share with you. That's just on the practical side. That's not really addressing kind of the things that you're talking about. Um, another thing I wanted to share was, um, so Peter Pronovo is uh, somebody who you might know in the patient safety sphere. Um, he, he shouldn't be, he, he has all of the classifications to be an asshole. So I, he, and maybe he is, I only know him from his public persona. Um, and uh, like anybody, you know, there is a, a, a book out there, Assholes, a Theory. So there is a, a strong movement to identify assholes and not hire them. So, you know, there is, there is this kind of thing out there um, at any rate. So he has come up with this idea of asking how the next patient's going to be harmed. Forget about the past. Forget about the near misses. Forget about the death. Forget about how is the next person going to be harmed? You're going to get the same information. So like, don't, you know, and you're going to get at it in a better way because there, there's no history to look up. There's no shame. You know, it's just, you know, so that's one thing. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing was because he kind of, I, I got the impression that he did get this stuff. He, he hired somebody to shadow him for a day. Um, somebody with, um, you know, social science background kind of thing who was taking notes during his day, during rounds and all the rest of it. And um, so at the end of the day, he, he thought he did quite well, you know, cause he was being watched. He knew he was, you know, so he, he thought he did quite well. And the scientist said, oh my God, Dr. Pornovo, you have a lot of work to do. And he said, what, what do you mean? And he, and the, the scientist said, the social scientist said, okay, remember that time when you were doing rounds um, with your residents, no, no, doing rounds with, with your nurses on the, on the ward and the residents came into the room, you immediately stopped talking to the nurses and turned your attention to the residents. Do you know what that did to those nurses? You have a lot of work to do, Dr. Pronovo. And I know this because he told this publicly, you know? So he didn't even realize that that kind of thing which was, a, it's a very normal interaction. My God, it's, an, it's a very, very, very normal interaction has profound implications for the people whose attention he was giving to the first time and that it was interrupted for somebody obviously of higher stature and they were more deserving of his attention. That major, major messaging in that. Yep. So oh, yeah. Just thought I'd, I'd share those things. I probably there are probably a few other things that I was thinking of, but I'll I'll stop it there. Time. Oh, nice. maybe maybe just one more thing. They, and I've been putting it in the chat. <laughs> All right. The leadership right. that we're talking about is not what we celebrate societally. We mm -hmm. have to understand this. What we reward as a society is like being on the news, having high stock prices, having, you know, we don't reward vulnerability. We don't reward humility. I wrote an article about this when, when you know, this was very tangibly, when somebody had demonstrated humility right before a podcast, they wanted to show that on their, um, on their podcast. And they couldn't even find it in the news. They watched it live on the weekend when they recorded the podcast on Wednesday. They couldn't even find the news story because we do not celebrate this stuff. That's the core issue here that we're, we're fighting against. We, mm -hmm. we celebrate values in societally that we are not talking about here. So we just, we, this is, everything we're talking about here is countercultural. So we are swimming upstream. So we just have to recognize that because it's a, it's, a harder, uh, it's a harder journey than we think unless we can recognize the barriers and the obstacles that are against us. We gotta put Rosa on that. What's the shaping the leaders ideas, <laughs> right? <laughs> Big piece of this. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah it's, uh, it's almost like a, a one person at a time thing. Uh, time, I mean, sorry, go ahead tomorrow. I noticed that Phil and Gary, and I think John, all were kind of motioning to speak. So did you want to invite one to start, Rosa? Uh, sure, Phil had his hand up first, so. Okay. 
-hmm. Yeah, it's just a, a, a point that we, we must recognize that it's, it's not always the, the people at the bottom that are faced with this problem. Um, I, I used to run focus groups, but they were like focus groups every tw or twice a week, every in two afternoons each week. And the people, there were eight people in the group and it was, it was understood by everyone that there was no hierarchy there. You, you were all equals and you had the, the right and opportunity to speak openly and honestly, and your anonymity was protected. And given the opportunity, people would tell you everything, real dirty things that you didn't really want to know about the business. Even the CEO said, the problem I have is that I don't know if people are telling, people are telling me what I should know or what they think I should know, what they think I want to know. And that was the CEO, CEO level. So, you know, we mustn't forget that it's, um, it affects all levels of the organization, this inability to speak up or trust in what you're hearing. The executive group is also subject to that, absolutely. Gary, you had your hand up. Yeah, okay, so I put a few things in the chat and I'm a very pragmatic person, so I wanna leave as a takeaway some tools that you can start using now. I go back to 1985, and Lauren, I'm going to take a cue from you. Can everybody see this book? Oh, no, no. no. because of your virtual. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> um, it's got my funny background. So, but what it is, it's uh, actually it's a book by Edward de Bono. It's called Six Thinking Hats, 1985, well before psychological safety, speaking up, speaking in, were even invented. But we had a situation where everybody was speaking, all right, but they're all speaking different ways here. So De Bono came with the idea, why don't we all think the same way at the same time? And let's do that under a hat. I now come to realize that what he was doing was actually creating psychologically safe zones under a hat. So I took that in a company I always worked for. I got certified into it. And that's how we actually did business cases. So we could actually go in there and kind of say, okay, let's look at all the, under the yellow hat, all the good things about this particular proposal. And always, of course, we'd have the accountants in there and the risk people, and they'd cross their arms, wear, be wearing their black hat and kind of saying why it didn't work. And all you had to say was a facilitator says, that's cool, hang on to that. We'll get there, we'll all get there. But right now we're all wearing the yellow hat. We mm -hmm. want to know what's good. As you can see them, they would sit there with their think, you know, arms crossed, the body language, but then they would get into it because they were being excluded because of their own behavior. And before you know it, they were into it. Then we went, then we'd say, oh, let's put the black gun on everybody and everybody have a good thing of the cigarette. And that's where we got the really conversations going. And I, as a, as a facilitator, would always end with the blue hat Blue being, let's, let's look at the overall things and what have we accomplished and summarize that. So that technique is available and it's actually used quite well. On the chat screen, I did put on there for your um, reference, um, a site that I manage for 12.12manage.com. 12 we have about 350 um, members around the world that are using this and practicing it here. I saw Mike's comment about you tried it, Mike, and it was very uncomfortable. And yes, it is because it's breaking these old patterns that we've got that we all have to speak at the same time. But more of that, it's speaking, posing again. Let's speak in parallel and that's a part of it. So I just want to mention that. I'm now going to flash forward to another book, which unfortunately you can't see, but this is Christian Bush's The Serendipity Mindset. It's just brand new, it's out here. And on page 50, He's got a whole section on why psychological safety is important, and why it's really important that you've got to create the environment so people can speak up. Otherwise, serendipity will not occur in your organization. If there's anything we need in this world of complexity, it's serendipity, the ability to look and actually not find luck, but actually create that sort of conditions that all these good fortunes will actually emerge for you. 
Thank you, Gary. And now our time is up. So I want to give Lauren the last word. Um, <clears throat> she says, I, I, you know, you don't realize where life will take you during my, my gra graduate degree. I wrote two big papers. One was on Edward de Bono and, uh, and the other one was on iatrogenic harm, like harm we didn't mean in healthcare. And that was 25 years ago, never realizing it would bring me to here today. Um, I, what I would love is just, um, feed, you know, besides a, a learning organization is a listening organization, you know, for us to all think about, you know, what does it mean to get to that place? And uh, I had to struggle and then you still cringe at times, but feedback is our friend, right? <laughs> oh, there he's got it. Feedback is your friend. And so I would love to hear any feedback on the ideas. Please feel free to contact me to chat about it. Meanwhile, I challenge everyone to think, um, just think on, uh, you know, what would it mean to move, move organizations forward to freedom to speak, right? And I purposely am driven, when I think of the silence, so I have a little picture, the leaders are like this, is that ask people around you, leaders, in that moment, you know that moment of silence at the meeting, right? What are we losing as an organization in that silence? What is lost in terms of safety? What is lost in terms of engagement? What is lost in terms of lives? And what is going to be the value of voice? What would be the value of voice in this organization? And um, what of anywhere you could put your, your time and energy, what is better than unlocking than what your, what your people already know? And what can that bring to the world? And I know, I know we have to do it in healthcare. We are going to do it. <laughs> but um, thank you. That's just thank you. Thank you, Rosa, for your support. And um, I'll download the chat and see all who is here. And just appreciate, appreciate you considering this um, new model. Well, thank you, Lauren, for, for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, we'll probably want to have you again. <laughs> <laughs> because we just scratched the tip of the iceberg, right? But thank you. And thank you to everyone who attended. I see Jim Marinas giving you the thumbs up. And uh, so thank you, everyone. And we'll see you for our next. Uh, oh, I have, a, I, have an I have an announcement. I have, yeah, I have an announcement. Okay. So it would be really great to keep the conversation going. So I put in the chat a LinkedIn discussion room that's private. Just only a few people like from our community discussions on Safepedia are coming into this room. So it's again, another safe place for us to keep sharing resources because I know people had resources and they're not working on when in the chat when I'm trying to pull them over. So maybe we can share them there also. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Yay, or evening. Thank you, Rosa and Tamara. Bye. Thank you, Bye. everyone.